can you say, this is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky? Why do we have to? Just try it. Oh, well, I can't. Do Deep it. breath. <laughs> okay. This is Dr. Amanda Zella Husky. Lindsay Malloy. Ah! Now, wait, say Dr. Lindsay Malloy. Dr. Lindsay Malloy. No, come back. <laughs> This is Dr. Lindy Malloy. Welcome to the Potato Podcast. <laughs> One more time. And then after that, can we have a candy bit? No. <laughs> Please, Mommy. Okay, ready? Pandemic Parenting Podcast. Excellent. Welcome to the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. I'm Dr. Lindsay Malloy. And I'm Dr. Amanda Zella Husky. We are two psychologists, scholars, and moms, and together we are the co-founders of Pandemic Parenting. We're here to share science-based research and help all who care for kids navigate this challenging time. In this episode, we're discussing all kinds of things, including attachment, what kids need from parents, but especially from fathers, what makes a good dad, what we can learn from other cultures about being a father, how the pandemic has impacted fatherhood, and maybe what changes we should keep moving forward, and why your kids need you to keep being you. Joining us for this conversation is Professor Michael Lamb, Emeritus Professor at the University of Cambridge, renowned developmental psychologist, and one of the the world's leading experts in fatherhood. Share this episode with all the dads you know and love and let us know your thoughts or questions you have on this topic by tweeting us at Pandemic Parent or by sending a message through our website, pandemic-parent.org. All right, let's get into our conversation. Welcome to Professor Michael Lamb. I'm so excited to have you join us today. I was lucky enough to do my postdoc with Michael um, many years ago, now over 10 years ago, which is hard to believe, at the University of Cambridge, which uh, were some of the best years of, of my life for sure. And so I got to see you firsthand as a, as a mentor and as a father, as I got to know your family. And so it's really great to have you here to talk about attachment and fatherhood today. So welcome. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Yeah, it's uh, amazing to think that it's over a decade. I know, yeah. it's terrifying too. So, okay, so and we I guess- we all look young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Except for the, pan- the pandemic has aged me about, you know, 10 years, I think, in one, <laughs> but uh, it's been rough. So I think we'll get into some of that and what it's meant mm-hmm. for parents. So let's start out by talking about and defining what we mean in this psychology research when we talk about attachment, because I think people have a lot of different ideas about what that means. So what do we mean in psychology when we talk about attachment? Well, in psychology, I think we're, we're particularly focused on the relationship between infants and children and um, those who take care of them. So the focus is very much on the, the child as the center of this. Obviously, we're talking about relationships with parents, and so they involve at least two people, the child and somebody else. But I think a lot of what's described as attachment more generally refers to relationships. And I think that's a slightly different take on this. What's of greatest interest to us is how these relationships form early in life and what it is that brings about what turn out to be both very close and uh, very formatively important relationships in early childhood. Yeah. So when we think about forming those relationships, which we know is really important and they can look different in lots of different ways, what are some things that just in general parents can do to promote their child being securely attached to them? The crucial thing about attachments is is that the underlying dimension is a dimension of trust. Um, And what's critically important over those early months of life is for children to come to trust, to count on, to know that they can count on adults to respond to their needs and their signals. Um, And it's that growing process of of coming to realize that this person, these people are there for me when I really need them. And, you know, really need them when you four months old is not quite the same as really need them when you're, when you're 15 or, or 35. It's a much more pressing um, demand at the, in those early ages. But it's that, that developing sense of trust and the reliability of those people to be there. That's critical to the concept of, of secure attachment. You know, when we talk about a secure attachment, we mean a child who essentially believes uh, and trusts that that person is going to be there when they're needed. Less secure relationships are relationships that involve various degrees of uncertainty about the trustworthiness of that person, whether or not they're going to be there uh, at all, 
or whether they're going to provide the appropriate and needed response. And both of those issues are what leads to um, insecure attachment. So the critical issue, to go back to your question, is learning to read your child's signals, understand what what the child needs, and to provide a timely and appropriate response to those signals and reads. Yeah, I think I, I'm just thinking about what you were saying too related to trust and where I see this come up a lot recently in conversations with parents is, you know, when they're frustrated that their child seems to act one way in school, you know, maybe they're very well behaved, compliant, all of those things. And then they get home and sort of completely fall apart, you know, and and so the parent doesn't understand what's going on. And, and that's one of the things like trying to explain that it's because your child feels comfortable with you and trusts you and feels safe that they can sort of really show you how they're actually feeling um, or demonstrate that in, in the ways, you know, depending on their developmental stage. So I do think in a lot of ways, sometimes that's a sign, you know, that there, there is a strong attachment here because your child, you are the safe haven that they can kind of be honest about how they're really feeling. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. And, and while it's particularly marked at the ages and, and context that you're talking about, the sort of getting home from a, a stressful or demanding time in childcare, that's also true into adolescence that, you know, kids may act out and, and show a side of themselves to their parents that they don't in other contexts, because these are the relationships that they feel allow them to, to ventilate um, mm-hmm. uh, and to express their emotions and perhaps to explore those emotions in, mm, in yeah. safer contexts. When I teach about attachment in my undergraduate classes, one of the questions that I get a lot of times from students is, you know, well, what happens if you don't have that early in life? Like what happens if you don't have parents who are responsive and consistent and sensitive to your needs? And maybe you do form an insecure attachment. Is it possible to form secure attachments to others? And yeah, the answer is is clearly yes, that, that kids typically form multiple attachments mm-hmm. and that those attachments can be very different in quality depending on the the characteristics, that is the responsiveness, the sensitivity, the reliability of those individuals. It's extremely rare for kids not to form attachments. You know, kids growing up even in remarkably uh, neglectful, abusive families do form some kind of attachments in in almost all cases. And as you say, some of those may be insecure in nature, but that doesn't mean that the child can't form other relationships. It probably means that the formation of those new relationships will be a little bit uh, more difficult. It probably means that the impact of that first uncertainty, lack of trust, is going to initially uh, color the, the formation of, of the second relationship. But as they as the, as those other individuals show their characteristics, show their reliability, show their commitment, then it becomes possible to form other relationships that, that can provide the support and the security that the child needs. Yeah, yeah. I think that's always very relieving to students um, to mm-hmm. share that side of it. It's not set in stone. So in thinking about forming multiple attachments, obviously one of our, our big focus this month is on Father's Day with Father's Day on the horizon. So for, and for a long time, fathers were definitely an afterthought in, in the research. Um, they weren't really uh, discussed much in terms of attachment. The focus was always um, for the most part on moms and it was just assumed that children's attachments to their fathers were were less important. So I guess now, you know, knowing what we know now, what can you tell us about these assumptions and what we know about fathers and the importance of uh, fatherhood for for children and for their development? Well, as as you say, we've we've learned quite a lot over the years and there are a lot of things that that haven't changed very much. When I started studying attachment in the very beginning of the 1970s, the prevailing view was that children were limited to one key attachment relationship, that they might later in life form other relationships, for example, um, with secondary parents, but that there was a uh, even a biologically determined um, narrowing to, to one single relationship. And there were a number of studies in the 1970s that, that I think 
put that belief to bed um, and made clear that actually children formed multiple relationships from the very beginning, early in infancy, that the typical child growing up in a two-parent family, uh, including what was the typical arrangement at that time, which was a stay-at-home mother and a breadwinning father, that even in those contexts, most children formed attachments to at least both of their parents, um, and sometimes to other people as well. Could have been a grandparent, could have been a an au pair, or some other person who was providing care for that child. Now, having said that most children form those relationships, it, it also seems to be the case that those relationships can differ in terms of their importance for children. And the relationships that children form to the person who is primarily responsible for their care do seem to be more important if we think about importance in terms of the formative impact on the child's development than their other relationships that they form. Where psychology, as I think, continue to have a problem is its inability to recognize that just because something is less important than another relationship doesn't mean that it's unimportant. We have lots of evidence that you know, even for children living in traditional uh, situations where one parent is more responsible for childcare than the others, nevertheless form two important relationships, at least two important relationships. Um, and in some circumstances, such as the one you talked about earlier, where, say, the first relationship was insecure and the second relationship is more secure, then it's especially important to have that second relationship because there is, I think, pretty nice evidence today that, that you know, even if the relationship with your, your primary parent, if I can use that term, is insecure, you are in some sense inoculated from the less positive effects of that relationship by virtue of having a, a second attachment that is more positive. So it's really important, I think, to understand that, that having multiple relationships is common, it's mm -hmm. typical. Those relationships uh, may not be the same uh, in character, and they may not be the same in terms of level of importance. But that doesn't mean we don't need to consider from a sort of a, a research point of view the, the multiple impacts, but also from in understanding the the real lives of real children to recognize that they are multiple uh, influences on their lives and multiple people they count on to support them in important ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think is such a relief, right? When we think about the idea of the village and we we need multiple people in our children's lives to fill different buckets. And so Absolutely. I think that's... We've for a long time recognized that the you know, the village metaphor, when it when it first came out, was sort of applied to non-Western cultures. And I, I think we do need to understand that the metaphor really does apply to um, many of the lives we live, even though they are much more constrained. And, and God knows they've been constrained over the last 15 months with many right. of us, you know, confined in these little bubbles where our children only see their parents and maybe one other chosen mm -hmm. person. It is important to nourish whatever relationships they have. And of course, to recognize that even if they lost 15 months of opportunity to form new relationships, that doesn't mean that they can't and shouldn't and wouldn't benefit from uh, you know, reestablishing and rekindling relationships with grandparents and, and mm -hmm. other people outside the home now. That's Absolutely. right. Yeah. yeah. Doing that right now. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking that, yeah. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, yeah, this it's been a brutal, you know, over year where we haven't had any sense of village. If we ever, you know, had that mm -hmm. before, it's just been a completely obliterated. And I know that's been really hard for, for us and for a lot of parents. Um, but one thing that I see and a I lot- I think it's also been really hard for, for the grandparents and for yeah. those other people in many countries. And again, we're thinking of the more affluent cultures um, mm -hmm. uh, where parents have been, or grandparents have, have been denied the opportunity mm -hmm. to see their grandchildren 
It's mm-hmm. both the, the children have suffered, the grandparents have suffered, and the parents have suffered from yeah. the yeah. lack of, of access to those alternative sources of care. Absolutely. And I see a lot of questions sometimes in these, you know, online parenting groups, typically mom groups, where parents are worried that their child is forming an attachment to the nanny or the, mm-hmm. the child care provider or the teacher, and they almost feel like, well, if they're forming this attachment to this other person, then what does that mean about my relationship with my child? And it's it's good to hear that this is not, you know, it's not pie. Like there's <laughs> there's enough right. to go around for everybody and that, you know, kids can form these meaningful relationships and it doesn't detract from your relationship with your child because they've done that. That's right. Absolutely not, yeah. no. Yeah. At Pandemic Parenting, we're committed to sharing our expertise and research in ways that are immediately accessible and useful to families. As part of our efforts to sustain and expand this work, Amanda and I are also available for virtual speaking engagements at your business, organization, PTO, and more. We want to help you and those you work with, grow with, and raise your children with have the chance to do so in an environment that fosters and supports your mental health. Some of the topics we speak on include parenting during the pandemic, the impact of trauma on children and families, children's development the mental health impact of COVID-19 on employees, and more. If you or your organization are interested in potentially collaborating with us, please reach out for availability and pricing through the Request a Speaker form on our website at www.pandemic-parent.org slash contact. So I'm thinking about you know, dads in particular, because as you said, Michael, you know, a lot of the research has been focused on that primary attachment with the mother. And you've been such a pioneer in this area, you know, one of the first to really look at attachment and fatherhood and how important that is. And and as part of that, you've done a lot of cross-cultural work on fatherhood and parenting, examining how it looks in different, you know, cultures and contexts. So as you've looked across all these contexts, you know, what makes a good father? Are there some sort of universal qualities or, or characteristics Characteristics that make a good dad? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And um, uh, because I think that the, the more research that we've done in different contexts with both mothers and fathers, the clearer it's become that, that what makes a good attachment relationship is much the same, whether you're talking about mothers or fathers or grandparents or care providers. It's not the distinctive features of the motherly behavior or the fatherly behavior. It's the ability to read and respond to the child's needs, to provide them with love and care, to be engaged with them, to meet them where they are, and and to authentically share with them. And that's where the the differences come in. I think um, it's important for if we're talking about fathers, for men to feel that they can be um, authentically themselves with their children. And if for, for some men, a crucial part of, of, of themselves is, say, engagement in sport and, and activities like that, then it's important for those men to really share those and to be engaged in those aspects of their children's lives, because that's what's important to them. And if a man, by contrast, is really not interested in sport and and, uh, is more interested in uh, literacy or perhaps uh, fine arts, then it's important to to share those sorts of activities. So I think for for a long time, there there was a focus on, you know, the need for fathers to demonstrate masculine behavior and it was the masculine uh, behavior and characteristics that they brought to the table and i think that put a, a pressure on on some fathers which was unnecessary because i think what what we know is much more important is the authenticity and the ability to to share emotions and to be able to show the child who you are what you are what you care about and um, what makes you passionately in love with that child? Because ultimately it's that passion and commitment that that's really important in keeping that relationship important. 
There's so many things I was just, yeah, just thinking about as you were saying that, that in, in many ways, sometimes what I most appreciate about, you know, my husband, the father of my kids is the ways that he pushes back against so many of the stereotypes, you know, you mentioned that he is, is happy for them to see him be emotional about things and be tender about things. And I'm, I'm so grateful in many contexts that they're having that example because it, it frees them to feel and be whoever they are in whatever context makes sense. But I, I think you're right. There's all these expectations of how dads are supposed to be and which buckets they're supposed to fill. And that's hard to push back against in different cultures. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's important to sort of add and, and maybe not necessary to add, but I'll add it anyway. I think they're the same uh, stereotyping demands on women. And that, oh, that don't get mothers, us started, Michael. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that mothers likewise are, are sort of told that they have to, you know, only manifest and draw on, on particular aspects of what makes them special or what makes them unique. Um, yeah. uh, and to the extent that you are, you know, trying to live up to some standard or stereotype, rather than being who you really are and who you want your child to know, I think that's limiting and restricting um, uh, on, on those relationships too. So I don't have to try to do the Lego with my kid is what you're saying because, <laughs> <laughs> because it is painful, painful, but I'm like, no, I want to show him that, you know, uh, you know, know, women can build things and they can enjoy it. But I, it's like, just, it's, it's awful for me, but I get through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, where I think those stereotypes come in too, sometimes is the way, and, and this will get in, you know, I think get into when we're talking about different family structures. Um, but sometimes in a, you know, heteronormative example where you have, a, you know, a mom and a dad, what each of their roles are supposed to be with the child, right? And so as the mom, I'm supposed to do these things. And as the dad, I'm supposed to do these things. And there isn't one right way to parent kids. They need different things from each of us in different ways. And your different children might need different things from each of you. So it is that attunement and attachment piece I think we keep coming back to. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's really nicely put. Yeah. Yeah. And you've done a lot of work with um, LGBTQ parents as well and, and, um, and research on parenting in, in those families. And so what can you tell us about that? I sort of, I guess, sort of just briefly, like what if neither parent identifies as male or both parents identify as male, for example? Again, what's critically important in all families and in all contexts is the sensitivity of the parent's behavior. Um, uh, their degree of investment in sensitivity to their, their children, regardless of their sexuality or sexual orientation, regardless of their gender. W- what's important is the uh, specificity of their behavior. And uh, another issue which w- we haven't really talked about, but is the quality of the relationships between those different attachment figures Mm. because um i think one of the things that that i think we underestimated early on in this research was the importance of of that that relationship focus very much on the dyadic qualities you know how those two parents were relating to the child but um, increasingly, it, it's clear that actually the harmoniousness of the, the total context is also really important for children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that even if they have uh, good dyadic relationships with parents, the, the quality of the, or the harmoniousness, the um, uh, willingness of the multiple adults to get along, support one another, is also really important. Perhaps as especially important in situations where parents no longer live together. You know, we, we know that in, in those situations, kids do better when they have meaningful relationships with both of their parents, and they do better yet when those parents can at least get along where the children are concerned, even mm-hmm. if they no longer wish to be together. Um, they, they need to convey to the children that they are both fully committed to that child's well-being and at least share that one 
commitment in their lives. Yeah. You know, as we approach Father's Day, yeah, you, there are quite a lot of, of fathers who don't live all the time with their children. Mm -hmm. And it's important for those to remember that, that their relationships with their children are still really important. Not only do they need to commit themselves to those relationships, but their partners need to understand, the, the mothers of the children mm -hmm. need to understand that for the children's needs, um, it's important to support and maintain those relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think the pandemic has caused some of those separations even more too, in terms of if our custody or our visitation schedule usually was this way, I mean, all of these added layers of complexity this past year has has made those schedules a challenge. Um, so so let's talk about the pandemic for a bit. So I know we may not know this yet, but how, you know, just given what you've been observing over the last year related to all the work you've done previously, like how do you think the pandemic has changed the lives of fathers? And do you think some of those changes will be around for a while? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think it's, it has clearly affected the lives of, of both mothers and fathers, but in, in quite different ways. And I think it's also been quite different for parents whose line of work made it possible for them to work from home and those who were not able to do that. You know, there've been a lot of survey research, particularly in the UK, but also in, in the US and, and somewhat less in Canada, showing that one of the key impacts of the pandemic has been to disproportionately affect women, that they have disproportionately had to assume the responsibilities of childcare and homeschooling, mm -hmm. um, even when they and or their partners were working from home. Mm -hmm. So there's been, uh, I think it's, it's very clear that the burden has, has not been equally shared and that the disproportionate responsibility that existed before has, has been exacerbated. So that's kind of the, I think, the headline finding from, from what we've seen. I think if, if we focus then specifically on fathers, there's been a fair number of fathers, hard to know whether it's a, a majority, but, but a substantial number where fathers who've been able to work from home have started to become more involved with their children, have come to realize all aspects of parenting. A lot of the aspects of parenting that they didn't see before, that has given them first some degree of empathy um, uh, and understanding of, of their partner's responsibilities and has in a substantial number led those men to change their, their view of what they should and could um, and actually do. There's been quite a lot written about this subgroup of fathers and I suppose the, the interesting question going forward is whether now that they've discovered a more, if you like, active involvement in fatherhood, are they going to continue with this? I'd like to think that they will, because I think for at, at least those few fathers who've been highlighted in the research, they've sort of seen this as, as a realization of something that they missed out on mm -hmm. and that this will be a, a more permanent change. I think there's, a, there's another large group of, of fathers to whose response to the pandemic led them to or force them to work more outside the home because their, their work couldn't be done from home, perhaps because um, they had to assume more of the breadwinning responsibilities because a partner was, was prevented from doing that. For those men, there's been a sense of, of losing out and, and they, they've become less involved in their children's lives. Mm. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen with that group. I suppose, I hope that um, as they return to two breadwinning families, that there'll be a recalibration within the home as well, and that those families will at least return to where they were before. You know, I, I think we, we know much less about those. As, you know, as, as always, our surveys tend to 
elicit much more information from the chattering classes than, <laughs> than from people who don't natter like like we do for our for our daily work and it's a little unclear what what's going to happen in those situations the, the impact is not going to be evenly spread i think it's going to mm-hmm. be quite uh, different for some families and for the second group of families there there needs to be some kind of dialogue uh, within the family about that will determine where things go in the future. Do so. you think that there are policy changes or sort of bigger, you know, societal things that could be done to allow some of the good that has come out of this um, to to be longer lasting for fathers? Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think one of the, the uh, hopes I have is that we'll be more aware of the possibility of working from home. And I was pleased to see this week that the, the U.S. government has, has um, uh, recommended that, that federal workers be allowed to engage in, in uh, teleworking more than they were in the past. You know, in, in a former life, I was a federal worker. And even though my work could be done quite well from home, I was a, under a lot of pressure to spend that time in an office right. um, uh, uh, when actually that wasn't the most efficient for my job. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I learned to compromise by going to a nearby coffee shop where I didn't have the telephone and I didn't have interruptions because this was the pre-internet days when um, <laughs> they didn't follow you. Um, uh, but, you know, there's, there's th- that would be one of the policy uh, things that I would hope for. I would also hope that there will be continuing uh, willingness to to recognize the importance of relationships with both parents and to you know increase the opportunities for parents to take parental leave when children are born mm-hmm. um, and especially this uh, is um, my long-term um, commitment to see people realize that parental leave needs don't end in the early months of life. Kids get sick, especially when they go to childcare, especially Mm -hmm. when they go to school. And being able to take time off from work to be home with a sick child Mm -hmm. is an absolutely essential policy. You know, if you look at this utilization of, of child care in the more civilized countries in, in Scandinavia, where you actually have these policies, you see just how much time it's necessary for parents to take off to be parents long after the first months of life. It's not something that should be limited to infancy. You know, my, my earnest hope is that we will see a much greater recognition of that and, to, and realize that you know, if, if a parent knows that they can take that time off to be home with a sick child, they're going to be better workers overall. Um, right. They don't do poorer quality work. Mm-hmm. It's much, uh, but you get much better work out of somebody uh, the, mm-hmm. when they're not worried about what's happening with the child. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if the pandemic doesn't teach us that, right, we've had this lengthy period of time for people to show I am able to work from home. I am able to still be productive and meet my family's needs. I mean, there's a lot of constraints. It, it hasn't been pleasant, but I no, hope exactly. that that employers, like you said, and, and policymakers can recognize the importance of that flexibility. But also, I, I really agree with the, the parental leave piece and just how societal expectations of fathers, right? Knowing what we know about attachment, the science is so clear about how important that is, especially in the first few months of a child's life and and ongoing, like you said, you know, so the expectation for dads that, you know, you'll be back two days later, you know, after your child Mm -hmm. was born and and isn't that for your, you know, wife or the child's mother to, um, Mm -hmm. to have that time, right? I just think it's so critical. And and I sure hope this time has taught us how important that is. Mm -hmm. Well, that, let's hope that's true. Yeah. So speaking uh, just also of, of shifting perspectives, you know, I've been thinking a lot about just, you know, what you said about fathers being home more, how work has changed and what that's meant as far as the types of roles they have in kids' lives. You know, so my husband usually travels for his job. So my kids have had this gift of their dad home for uh, the better part of a year and a half now. And so we've been thinking about like how 
how do you think the pandemic has changed how children view their fathers um, or their relationships? Well, again, I think it's probably, you know, varies a great deal depending upon the, the nature of the work and, and the way the pandemic has affected those those people. You know, I think for many kids, as, as, as you say, has allowed them to get to see their fathers um, uh, more and in more contexts and to learn more about their strengths, their limits, their goals, their responsibilities. One would hope in those situations that, that you know, a lot of the people who travel for work will perhaps do more Zooming in, in the future right. than, than traveling, because mm-hmm. we've learned you can do more there. In other cases, you know, the, the essential workers, the people who've had to work outside the home, I think it's going to be a very different kind of a context. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's quite hard to to predict what will happen in those situations. You know, it depends on, on how well the messages conveyed that a lot of those were were necessary and that part of their the purpose of not being there was actually to provide economically for the for the family. Yeah. Um, uh, and th- th- those messages, you know, do depend on there being some kind of, of coherent agreement about that. The clear messages provided to the children by the, the various people in their lives that that what's happening is important and has been uh, beneficial. Mm. Yeah. What about us moms who've learned through the pandemic what a better parent the other parent is? <laughs> and and yes. how, how are we supposed to cope with that? Uh, <laughs> Getting. Well, you know, it's important to always remember the um, <laughs> the the differences, and that children really need to benefit from those those differences. We all beat ourselves up about the things that we think we don't do well, and it's important to recognize that kids need that diversity and that they recognize those differences. What you're describing is them getting an opportunity to to better know and understand how to manipulate those parents in the <laughs> yes oh or tell on the other parent this isn't how you did it yesterday why is he making us do this <laughs> apparently i don't make the frozen pizza as well as daddy does so. <laughs> that's like <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly you know if that's so, the worst thing you, you're doing then <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right exactly so do you have as we sort of sign off do you have any any last kind of message or, or thoughts you might want to share with with parents or dads specifically right now I think the important message is um, that children benefit when they enjoy you being yourself um, and that it's really important for parents to share themselves as fully as they can. I think one of the things that, that many parents have been especially uh, aware of over this last year is just how rapidly kids change um, uh, and how important it is to seize the moment um, uh, and make the best of it because we never get to relive those moments. So mm. do what you can yeah. while you can. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Pandemic Parenting Podcast. Make sure to hit follow or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whichever platform you're listening on to be notified of future episodes. We'd also love to connect with you on social media. Look for our blue and yellow logo when you search Pandemic Parenting on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or YouTube, and you'll find us. Or follow the links in the show notes. Let us know what you think of this episode by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Your five-star review helps us move up the charts to reach even more parents and caregivers. If you have a specific question or topic you'd like us to address in a future episode, let us know. You can email info at pandemic-parent.org and mention podcast in the subject line. And this podcast isn't all we do, by the way. Pandemic Parenting is a 501c3 nonprofit providing free science-based resources for parents and all who care for children while navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. To learn more about our organization and access our extensive library of webinars, videos, blogs, and more, visit www 
www.pandemic-parent.org. Lastly, this show wouldn't be possible without supporters like you. Lindsay and I donate our time to this podcast, but we do have an incredible team working behind the scenes to make this all happen. If you'd like to support the show beyond leaving your five-star review, visit www.pandemic-parent.org support and donate today. Thanks for listening. Hope you can join us next time.